Cool. I think we are live. Hi, Ted. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, Alicia. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, it's a funny where we're like, oh, so we start with a joke and, and you were like, oh, no, I don't know any jokes. <laughs> like, I don't know any all, jokes. All out of jokes. This is a very serious presentation today. <laughs> <laughs> is it though? <laughs> it always is. Yeah. We I think have... we're both very passionate about photogrammetry. So, um, so yeah, it's going to be a good one. Yeah, I can't. I couldn't agree more. I the reason I'm here is because of photogrammetry. So uh, I, I I love it and I owe a lot to it. So let's let's share some of that. Um, yeah. I think what we're gonna try to do today is get a little bit more into the sort of the the inner workings of photogrammetry, kind of exploring what to do, what not to do. Uh, and yeah. I have a few examples of sort of what not to do or sort of how to fix, if you will. So I don't I don't want to I, I don't want to show the best. Right. Let's let's show the reality of, of this pretty tricky yeah. sometimes uh, tool that we're using. The do's and the don'ts of drone photogrammetry. And I would like for anyone that is maybe like not familiar and maybe like starting to be familiar with drone photogrammetry, kind of like leave this session today and think that yeah, you know, I, I kind of like understand a little bit better how to make the most out of 3D scan data um, to build photogrammetry models. Is it that fair to say? I think that sums it up. Perfect. And as always, keep your comments coming. That's the only way that we have to um, to see your questions. So keep your comments coming um, and we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Um, so yeah, let's deep dive, Ted. Yeah, let's jump in. So I, I made this little agenda for us so we can yeah. have some structure. Uh, not as many slides this time as last time. I'm sure everybody's used to my slides, <laughs> but we're going to freestyle it a little bit. Um, yeah. So I wanted to start sort of just with a over, like a general workflow concept, right? We, mm -hmm. we we talk about a few different deliverables in this space. Like we're, we're showing uh, AutoCAD drawings, we're showing point clouds, we're showing 3D meshes. So all of those things, they come at different stages. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and then let's dive into what makes that possible, which is the inputs, right? We have our images, we have data within our images that are contained in EXIF uh, formats. We have our controls or, or scale constraints, whatever you want to talk, call them, just something that we can use to reference and, and, and geo-reference the whole model afterwards. And then we have our software. So um, there's a ton of software. Today, I the examples and sort of the case studies that we're going to go through, I'm going to include uh, Pix4D Mapper, which is my one of my all-time favorites. I have a lot of experience with it. Uh, reality capture and context capture and see how those yeah. differ. But I want to emphasize Skydio is compatible with most, I would say, with all photogrammetry platforms. We do not push for one in particular. We know and we understand. I, I think in the photogrammetry space, it's, um, it's funny. Like, there is not one that fits, uh, fits all. So, like, whatever, just think about what are your needs and requirements and based on that, um, you know, make uh, choose whichever software that you know fits best for for your needs. So, um, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, we are I, not we are not selling any of the for the nope. platforms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm in a lucky, I'm in a pretty lucky position because I, uh, I'm a professor and, and I teach yeah. photogrammetry. I have EDU licenses for a lot of these tools, um, and I need to have them because I need to really explore pretty deeply how they all work to in order to teach them. So, um, not everybody's in that position. But again, photogrammetry, the great thing about it is that it's it's agnostic to anything except yeah. for just images. As long as we have photos from a camera, it doesn't matter what camera, it'll work. Um, exactly. So after we sort of die, talk about that a little bit, which we already have, uh, let's talk about alignment, which is sort of the first major step. It has to be successful. If we if this step fails, the rest of it is not going to go well. And alignment is also called calibration. It's also called aero triangulation. Traditionally, in the in the traditional photogrammetry workflow, that's um, that's kind of like the name. So if you see that on different software platforms. Alignment, calibration, error calibration. Re registration sometimes. Registration. Yeah, yeah, there's there's all these terms, but at the end of the day, all it means is uh, can we figure out where the cameras were or where the yeah. picture, where the drone or the camera was when it took that picture. Yeah, so you have yeah. a, the metadata will bring like that kind of like reference and then the first step is calibrate or reorientate those images to where the real position was. 
Yeah, exactly. And and the key mm -hmm. to that is overlap. So the ongoing theme overlap is king. We absolutely need to have lots of images, but then also lots of the similar content in each image. Uh, and and you know, there's there's different rules of thumb, if you will, but stitching depends on overlap. And if you don't have the overlap, then none of this will work. Yeah, stitching basically. Theodore is saying yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Basically. Cool. And then finally, georeferencing scale. Yeah. Positioning. Yeah. So this is something also that uh, comes up quite a lot. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're used to doing photogrammetry from the top down and doing surveys and volumetrics and that sort of thing. And in that case, it's, it's, it's not always necessary to do scale or positioning. In a lot of other cases, though, it is. So it's one of those things that you really want to use these tools in mm -hmm. georeferencing mm -hmm. if you need to have them. Uh, and uh, it, not all are the same. So we'll talk a little bit about how I do it in a few examples as well, especially bridges, which are different. And we'll talk about, you know, absolute accuracy versus relative accuracy versus precision versus resolution. So I wanna, I wanna also like uh, go over all these concepts and make sure that um, we know what we are talking about when we say absolute relative accuracy resolution. Yeah, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna default to you for that. You're the one that went to school for <laughs> surveying. I'm all self-taught on this type of stuff. So that was a long time ago. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need your help. <laughs> all right, so let's cool. uh, let's, let's dive in. So uh, I made this little slide just to sort of break down the most common uh, sort of workflows that I do. Not everybody's workflow is going to be the same. This is just how I think about it. Um, so at the top here, we have the steps, right? Alignment, we, we get all our cameras uh, registered with each other using that overlap and nice image. And mm -hmm. then once we've done that, we have something called a sparse cloud. So in the alignment step, when we're done with that, what can this be useful for? Well, you could actually do a lot by just running this first step. You don't have to do these other two steps if you don't need them. So yeah. what I use, what I can do with alignment or what, what I've used it for in the past is to determine camera position and orientation, right? And I can take that just position of each camera and I can bring it to something else. Um, and I can also use this step to perfectly scale my model, georeference it, and even just make measurements on the pictures themselves. So I was gonna say that, yeah, because yeah. some, some software platform like context capture and help me here, like I'm sure some others as well, after the calibration, after the error triangulation or the registration, they will allow you actually to do like a quality check and also basic measurements. So they, with the cameras already oriented, um, they kind of like overlap all the images so you can check coverage, you know, the quality of that, uh, the overlap. And um, they also have like basic measurements to do like distances and even volume calculations. So I think that's a, a very good tool to keep in mind when you are doing like a very complex infrastructure, you wanna make sure that, you know, in the field you're gathering the right data and that you have the right data before you go back to the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well put. So in terms of measurements, you know, we don't always need to be measuring from a 3D object, yeah. right? We yeah. Sometimes we'd like to just quickly measure from a 2D image. Uh, mm -hmm. So in order to do that, we first need to triangulate all the cameras, figure out where they are. Once that's done, we can actually just draw a line on each image and get the resulting measurement from that line or an area. So it, it can be really flexible. So it's it's a really nice step. And it, again, it has to be done, but it's mm -hmm. nice that you don't have to do everything because these two, they take some some extra time. Generally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the alignment will be what is fair to say, like a you know a few minutes for a. How actually do you know by heart how long did it take for this bridge model? No. So alignment generally is one of the mm -hmm. faster steps, um, and alignment really depends on the data set. For, so for this bridge, I believe the alignment was like an hour, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and different softwares, they take different amounts of time for each step, and they do them a little bit differently too. So we'll talk a little bit yeah. about sort of what's happening there, uh, but there's no rule of thumb. What you can do is you can do really quick alignments in the field and then just check your data, see if it's gonna be good enough for you to pack up and go to the office. And that's what I sometimes do. Uh, but generally you're gonna wanna do the alignment and just sort of let it sit. Could take could take a while if it's a big data yeah. set. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so you have the alignment done. And uh, right. what's the next step? 
So generally, after we have alignment done, we go to the second step, which I call densify, and it's it's referred mm -hmm. to as densification a lot of a lot of times. So this alignment step gives us our camera positions, but it also gives us a sparse point cloud. So it's like a a, a series of points that sort of resemble our object or whatever we're scanning, but there's not an, there's not many of them. They're sort of they're scattered. Uh, and those the, are the those are the tie points. Yeah, the automatic tie okay, points, yeah. the tie points that the software picked up on its own. Um, yeah. So they can be useful, but if we want to go into more detailed models, then we need to create more of them. So this mm -hmm. densification step is basically very similar to that alignment step in terms of what the software is doing. It's just doing a lot more of it. Um, and, and from that result, we generally get what we call a dense point cloud. So that's what uh, uh, we have here. Um, and, and that cloud can now be used for several other things. I personally think the point clouds are extremely useful. I, sometimes I like them better than meshes, which is the third step. But that's what, controversial. I didn't know this. You know, <laughs> it, it, you. <laughs> it, it really depends. What I, what I love about point clouds is that they're very easy to filter. So what I mean by that that's is, the, yeah. for example, on this bridge, that you see in this mm -hmm. alignment phase, if we don't want this railing uh, to be part of our, our data in the next steps, we can just mm -hmm. take that out in the dense cloud and then the preceding steps won't include those points. So I think, again, it comes down to what you're trying to do and the applications, the deliverables that like your workflow requires and then reverse engineer from that. You Do you really need a point cloud? Do you really need a 3D mesh? Do you maybe need the two of them? Um, so could you actually tell me what are the different applications? Why do you use the 3D mesh and the point cloud, what are the different applications you use with each of them? Yeah, so for, for point clouds, uh, those are useful for measurements uh, and extraction. So anytime mm -hmm. you you mm -hmm. see our examples where we have the bridge in the 3D model and then we have yeah. the bridge uh, in like a CAD line work BIM model, the, that was actually extracted from the dense from the cloud. Point from the point cloud. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So that and the reason being is because you will be able to pick the points much more easily than with a 3D mesh, correct? Exactly. There's just so yeah. many more points. There's more precision. Uh, mm. The ac the accuracy is the same, but the precision is better in a dense cloud, um, and, okay, and that allows hold, us to go from point to point. Hold that thought. Let's let's actually start. Yeah. Start. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that a little later too. For precision sure. versus accuracy. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so I, I love point clouds, but a point cloud is a point cloud is a point cloud. So a point cloud created from a laser scanner is essentially the same exact thing as a point cloud created from photogrammetry. It's just how do we yeah. get to that point cloud that differs, right? Um, so then our, our last sort of uh, step or deliverable or package, I we're going to refer to that as the mesh. Um, mm -hmm. This can be 3D. It could also be 2D in terms of ortho mosaics and DSMs yeah. and those things that we see in the surveying side of, of this industry. Uh, but for this example, we're going to be talking about the mesh the actual triangulated points uh, and the surface and the textures. So the, the visual information that's coming from the pictures and it's basically just painted onto that mesh. And those are two yeah. separate components. And and the obviously you can create a mesh also with a, so in 3D scan, we have the ability to do 3D capture. So that's the one that will adapt the fly plan to your, um, to your 3D objects. You can also do a three, uh, um, excuse me, uh, you can also do a 2D GPS capture, a 2D, ca 2D capture, which will allow you to generate an also mosaic, but also a 3D model. You just will miss the information of the um, any elevated structures, basically won't have that information, but still might be good enough. Like, for example, mm -hmm. for stockpiling, for volume measurements, um, is absolutely good enough. So again, we go back to what you need for your, your project, and I'm going to be very, very, um, you know, emphasizing this all the time because I think people tend to just go for everything and they might not need, you know, point cloud, 3D mesh or some mosaic. So just think about what you need and then reverse engineer from that. Yeah, I, I have had people ask me like, hey, have you ever used your Skydio for volumetrics and, and measuring mm -hmm. pi piles of dirt or what is it, whatever it is? And yeah. absolutely, it, I have because it's it's the same thing. It doesn't really it, it doesn't really change as long as you have all of these things that we're going to talk about in, in in that input. Then the deliverables are essentially the same. But the 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 way you actually define that fly plan will massively impact the time yeah. in the field and the time in the office. So for a stockpile, for example, I will go for a 2D capture. It's super quick, like in matter of like four or five minutes, you can capture like hundreds of pictures that are good enough. 
for then like photogrammetry software, create your 3D model, your orthomastic, do those volume calculations. And that will take you maybe like a couple of hours compared to a 3D capture, which will be, first of all, longer flying time and second of all, longer processing time. So um, yeah. it will be, you know, it will be like a massive difference between, um, uh, you know, 2D and 3D and the resulting mm -hmm. accuracy and deliverables will actually be enough. Yeah. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. The, the capture, especially when we're talking about 3D and in terms of structures that have elevation, it's completely more complicated as far as 3D scan completely yeah. changes the game for me. Um, but when yeah. we talk about ortho mosaics, or like you just mentioned, like top down is usually what we think about, but you can also extract orth orthos off of facades, off of the sides. Yeah. So in Pix4D, that's called an ortho plane. So a, a lot of these softwares, as long as you have that dense cloud and you have that, that picture information, you can extract 2D versions of that ortho from any angle yeah. that you'd like, which is really useful. All yeah. right, so let's uh, let's keep going. Image quality. Image quality. So yeah. we, we had these in the first webinar, but we didn't have too much time to go over them. What I wanted to really get across here is that when we are talking about photogrammetry, and generally this photogrammetry that I'm doing, I'm doing it outside. So yeah. there's a ton of photogrammetry that's done inside, and that's really where photogrammetry started. You can control the lighting conditions. You can cross-polarize your light. You can do all kinds of fancy tricks outside it's a different it's a different environment completely so in this example you can see what i mean uh by by those factors we have this reflective tile surface here that's way overexposed you know anytime yeah. you see just pure white in an image think of that as just being a void of information there's nothing yeah. really there for us to grab onto in that image that's going to be noise in your in your final 3d deliverable like there is no information photogrammetry cannot do magic <laughs> so yeah it's just it's just basically we can extract like photographic can't extract information if there is no information on the pixel so how yeah. would you handle this? How do you handle when, because there's an element of like, okay, um, fly, you know, in cloudy conditions. Well, yeah. I'm based in California. I can't like there's literally yeah. no cloudy days. So how do you handle that, Ted? You, you were, yeah, for, it's, it's, that's, a, that's the age old question. How do you handle cloudy days versus sunny days versus overcast days where the clouds are moving very quickly? Like here today, we were really overcast earlier. It was like pristine mm. photogrammetry conditions for outdoors. And then now the clouds are breaking and the sun is coming in and out of the picture. So there's only so much you can do. But at the, at the end of the day, there's a little bit of planning in the field, uh, regardless of those conditions. So mm -hmm. maybe schedule your scans so that they are opposite it to the movement of the sun that day maybe take some time some breaks between them to let the sun change its angle and then maybe the reflection will be more favorable for the area that you're intending yeah. to and also the shadows will be a, a much like you know the more are minimized the better um winter mm -hmm. has longer longer shadows shadows are not good for photogrammetry although the algorithms have improved massively in the last few years but like there is still an element of um some noise coming from there mm -hmm. so yeah. And, and there's a lot of things you can do after the fact. So I, I call it pre-processing, but generally in this in a picture like this, we have a, 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 a dynamic range that's pretty large. So what I mean by that is that we have really bright areas and mm -hmm. then we have dark areas in the same image. Uh, so when we're, when we're taking a file from our camera, if it's a JPEG, uh, we can play around with that JPEG. So what we can do is we can turn down the, the highlights, so those really bright areas, and hopefully extract some more information there. And maybe we can turn up the shadows and extract some more information out of that dark area. The JPEG, though, only gives you so much latitude to do that. So in really tough conditions, especially bridges or, or really bad days for this, what I usually like to do is shoot in RAW or DNG, which is a much bigger file, um, and then edit that file because it actually contains some information that you can't see until you bring it out in some software like Lightroom or, or Capture One, which is just photo editing software. Would you say this is a more more like this is kind of like a best practice for more advanced users like I, I, I kind of like every time that I hear about you know pre-processing the images I'm like oh you might actually lose information in that process um, and yeah. trying to do something 
it's it's really not that advanced to be honest if you've ever edited a picture on a mac or on a or on a pc and like you know pictures from your phone like it's the same thing we're just okay. making it look prettier uh but for, for for the photogrammetry engine what that's actually doing is giving it more points where it could sample from and give it some okay. signatures so enough, really yeah. the ones we're really worried about to be honest is the overexposure the shadows like you said they can they, they kind of suck but they're not as bad as just mm -hmm. pure lack of information which is cool. what there is where there's brightness so uh, and because we're moving we can't really control where that bright area is along all of our pictures so in this example over here overcast day perfect mm -hmm. conditions over here bright day right you can see the difference uh in in this image and you can see how when we're moving and capturing these images that overlit area or that overexposed area seems to be in the same part of the frame regardless of which image we're taking Yep. Yeah. So this is generally, you know, we, we, we have to deal with it. I, I highly, uh, I'm a big proponent of pre-processing. I think it can make a huge difference and I've seen it make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So if, if you do want the best results and we're talking about best practices here, I would recommend it if you, okay. if you need. Fair enough. Our, yeah. All right. So let's let's dive into a little bit of a, a case study, and we'll we'll talk a little bit deeper about some of these concepts. So uh, this is a, a facade scan. So it's a little bit different than than what I usually do. But in in this case, we wanted to create basically a, a digital copy of what this building's facade state was like. Right. There's going to be some construction next door, and we want to make sure that during that construction process we have a record of where it was when we started. So um, what you're seeing here is the scans that were used to construct this. And I chunked it out, like I talked about last time. It's, I think, really good practice to break things down into smaller, more manageable chunks, uh, and then bring all those things together uh, mm -hmm. later on. Um, so the first chunk was the roof. Uh, the second chunk was this uh, elevation on the side, the very long one, lots of images to capture here. And then we did the front of the building and then the back of the building. We didn't have to do the other side conveniently. Um, and I timed this so that I started with the roof when the sun was almost directly above it. Sorry, actually, I started with the front when the sun was facing it, and yeah. then I did the roof, and then I did this main elevation here, this west, or sorry, the south elevation, and then I did this west elevation when the sun was starting to set. So I kind of followed the trajectory of the sun in my planning, and that's to why make sure, yeah, yeah, and that's why chunking was so important. And so, and from a 3D scan point of view, Tez, can you explain me? So you didn't do a 3D capture of the entire building, which is really interesting. So how did you, um, what, what are the, did you use a 3D capture of each of the facades and then the ceiling? How did you do this? Yeah, so you're seeing that here. I basically just took uh, slices of each elevation in the 3D scan. So I set up the pillars just out, just in front of the building, and then just a little bit inside from some sort of looking top down uh, interior to the building. So this is what the working surface started like. Yeah. Uh, and then once that was established, and I was happy with the amount of overlap, especially in here between the two sides that I was going to combine together later. So you, you use the pillars like kind of like a little bit inside the building to make sure that you had enough overlap in between the facades. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So I essentially, when I was flying the drone, when I was flying the Skydio in that augmented reality view, when I'm dropping the pillars, mm -hmm. I'm flying above the building and just slightly inside and 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 to the right. And then on same thing on the other side of this corner. So doing what I can to just slice off one facade at a time, yeah. but then also making sure that I have a little bit of overlap between them. In between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I actually also had ground control points that we'll talk about in this example as well, which I wanted to make sure that I have at least three of those in each slice. So that will help me put everything together uh, afterwards. Yeah. We've been talking about doing a 3D scan live from the fields um, just to show you, uh, well, everyone um, live, how to set up 3D scan for like different use cases. So bridge will be one that I would love to do with you, Ted. Um, but also like building facade will be another one that is on my list. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned. States. Yeah, there's there's lots of examples because so so to capture this with a manual drone would have been really challenging. In fact, I did mm. have a, a manual drone with me that day and I and I attempted it. It, it. So the thing is that while I was able to capture the data, it wasn't at consistent overlap or at consistent distances from the building. Mm. So I really I, I'm not quite sure about how good that's going to turn out 
when I process. But with this, I know for sure the overlap is there. And I know that the ground sampling distance is going to be awesome. Um, we have someone asking, what was the overlap in this, on this job? Um, did you said, did you said, well, you, you're a big fan of 70-70, but like what, what was the overlap on this one? Yeah, so the overlap, I really just consider it based on what I'm looking at. So let's see if I can find it here. I think I start. So it looks like I tried to do 80 and 75. So I went for a little okay. bit more overlap than I usually do. The reason for that is that while this building is well lit, um, there's no shine. There's a very few shiny surfaces. The, the problem that I saw coming was that what you're looking at is very similar across pictures, right? The facade is a, a basically just a copy paste uh, of windows across. So when the photogrammetry engine is looking for features that are unique, it might actually get confused because so many things are actually very similar in yeah. the real world. Yeah. yeah. So I went, went, went for a little bit more. And sorry if I'm going ahead of uh, getting ahead of myself, but like when you process this in the photogrammetry software do you process the different facades and then combine them all or do you load all of the flights and then process all of that together how do you how do you handle this on the photogrammetry software yeah it's a good question i'll show you that in in the other uh screen when we switch okay. over to the to the data Perfect. here so if you want to switch me over to the desktop that i have i'll uh, yeah. i'll get started on yeah, explaining that um Okay, we're good. Yeah, oh, is okay. it working? Yeah, yeah we're, we go. we're good. Okay, so um, in terms of the photos that I use, so this is just the, the scan folder that comes off of the Skydio after the 3D scan is complete. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first thing I do is I generally just look them over. So you can see in some of these photos, these little green markers, mm -hmm. and that's where my ground controls were. So, uh, you know, you may have seen ground controls as targets or as, you know, reflective things. Really, all you need to do is to be able to find that point. Um, and as well as sort of finding the center of that point. So what I use is this high visibility spray paint and I make sure that I spray it completely vertical. So it's just a circular blob. Uh, and then I get the GPS position right in the center of that, uh, of that marker. Okay, cool. So I, I, um, I yep. can I just mention, um, you were using Skydio 2 plus, sorry. I just saw a comment passing by you were, you were using Skydio 2 plus for this mission. Yeah, I was using okay. a S2 plus, um, Actually, I think I was using an S2. That was before I had the S2 yeah. Plus. Yeah. Uh, so the nice thing about this kind of work is that you're really not that uh, not that far away from the drone at all times. The S2 Plus has a, a lot better range compared to the S2, but I never had any problems with the S2 here because I'm literally, it's right there. It's just at the top of a few hundred feet away from me. Um, so yeah. it worked really, really well. Um, and, and the images, the lighting, it was great. And you can see the overlap that's happening behind, uh, beside all of these uh, images. So I'm, I'm really happy with this. Uh, and then another thing that I always check is the metadata. So is is there GPS information with uh, this photo that's saved within the photo? So you can do that just by clicking on the info or details. Uh, but seeing this map here and this point on a map reassures me that there is additional information with this photo and it's stored within the photo itself, the metadata. So tell us more about the metadata. So that's you take the you go into the Windows folder, right click, go to properties, and that's the mm -hmm. active data. So data, additional data that comes with the picture. Um, right. So right click properties and then mm -hmm. go to details. And what you'll see here is a whole bunch of information about this. I don't know if it's clear enough on your screen, but what I see and the things that I'm looking for uh, to make sure are here is the camera model. So right here, it says Skydio 2 plus. Oh, I guess it was a 2 plus. <laughs> it shows <laughs> it shows me the capture setting. So the ISO, the, the shutter speed. And then ultimately under GPS, I see a latitude and I see a longitude uh, and an yeah. altitude. So I'm happy if I have all of those things there. Yeah, and then for most photogrammetry software, this will be automatically loaded. And even for example, in contest capture, we have a definition of a camera cal the camera calibration details. So you don't need to worry about uploading this. Once you input your data, contest capture automatically identifies this is coming from Skydio 2 Plus. Mm -hmm. And this is the camera um, details like focal length and things like that. So yeah. no yeah. need to worry about that. However, for Pix4D, for example, we do use a different file, which is automatically generated in the folder directory together with your, with your images. 
Um, so it's, it's something called like PIX for the, um, can't remember the name, but it's a CSV file and you need to input that in the photogrammic software. Yeah, um, so so here I have it on the screen here is context capture, just the first screen where you add the photos and you can see mm -hmm. that right away it picked up the 3000 photos, it says camera, it's recognized it's a two plus, it's got the sensor size and the focal length and the equivalent. So those are like lens information details that you need to have uh, and the closer to, to the actual facts, the better. Uh, you need to have those to succeed in the alignment phase. That it really Really exactly. helps to have that and generally all the major drones all the major cameras there they have this information baked into that uh, picture and then the software picks it up regardless if it's context capture pix 4d what have you yeah 100 percent um and um once you so you basically this is this is a, a like it works kind of like the same in most photogrammetry uh, platforms so you input the data and you know automatically you should be able to see that's coming from skydio 2 plus or whatever it is and um, if you don't know how to do these steps and um, there is a blog post on the skydio website and um, to help you go through that workflow for context capture reality capture pix for the um, and some other software platforms so go to the website skydio.com and in the blog post you will find that um sorry in the in the blog you will find a post with uh, with that step-by-step -step workflow yeah, it's a really good resource. And essentially what that data that's in that image is doing for us is this is the first part of that f workflow, right? So we're trying to align. This is even before alignment and you can see these red dots uh, and then these blue squares or blue crosses. The red dots are just being the, the location for each of these pictures, which is represented by these dots is just being collected from that metadata. So you can see mm -hmm. how they are already sort of aligned for us. Uh, but the one thing that we're missing is orientation. So that's mm -hmm. part of this next alignment phase and it's super duper important. So um, it, it, it always really just works the same way in this, this part. Um, yeah. in, in terms of the blue crosses, so those represent the ground control points. So where you saw those uh, little green blobs, uh, the GPS uh, uh, location that was collected with the, with the rover, um, it, when I bring it into uh, the software, it, it denotes it as that blue mark uh, so here i'm confident that my gps and my photos they're all on the same coordinate system everything is going to work well for me in the next few steps do you want to um just be mindful of the time because we're half an hour in do you want to start talking about the contour points since we mentioned them or will we yeah. wait no, yeah. let's, let's dive right in it. So once we do that first alignment phase, I'm, I'm doing this in uh, Pix4D here just to, to give you guys a, a, a sort of an overview of it. What mm -hmm. you see here is a combination of things. It looks like kind of a mess here, but the blue dots represent where those pictures started. So where the metadata in the photo uh, told the software it was. And mm -hmm. then the green dots represent where the software actually calibrated that camera to. In this example, it, don't be worried about this if this ever happens to you. If you see these large differences between where it started and where it was calibrated, especially if it's in the vertical, that generally means that we were using different vertical datums uh, between these two data sets. So that's the case here. The images coming from the drone come from the GPS WGS84 uh, vertical datum. And then what I was using yeah, because we we're looking, Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. it's not a concern. But really what we're looking at here is that Pix4D has figured out where the cameras were and then where they should be calibrated to. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yep, go ahead. And so, no, and so the influence of control points in this process is massive. Like basically, if you don't have that control points in your data set, which is absolutely fine if you're just looking for relative accuracy. And mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that difference between relative accuracy and absolute accuracy. If you have like control points, basically you're pushing all all your data, all your photogrammetry data to be aligned to mm -hmm. your control point. And um, so that information, which typically is, uh, comes with like survey grade accuracy. So you are in between, you know, one to five centimeter accuracy. So you're pushing all your um, data to be basically aligned to whichever information is coming from the control point. So that's why you, those differences are so large in this case. If you that that's right. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, without control points, you're generally still going to get very good 
accuracy yeah. if the images are good. The control points are the cherry on top. They really tighten things up and they also give you a way to verify your work. So without the control points, okay. there's no way for you to really know unless you you went out and measured it by a, with a ruler. Mm -hmm. Control points can also be used just to verify that what you did is correct. Exactly. And, and so uh, if you are not using control points, your relative accuracy will still be very, very good. Um, but you don't have to use spatial accuracy. So let's put an example. If you are measuring coordinates on your 3D model, um, if you are doing that on your uh, on a data set that has no control points, probably that coordinates will be you know off by I don't know like give me uh, like maybe 40 centimeter, maybe like half. Like it depends on how. Um, it, yeah, it's a, it's the wild west. You it really can west. depend. There's so many different factors that go into it. So it is what it is when you don't. It use is control. what it is. But you don't need it because normally, for example, if you're doing volume calculations, you don't need to know where that stockpile is in the world. What you actually are looking is how accurate that volume calculation is. Mm -hmm. And so that's when resolution comes in the in the conversation because the resolution basically um that's the information that you capture in your pixel mm -hmm. so when your ground sample distance so that's the pixel size is like for example two millimeter versus like 20 millimeter then you are going to be much more precise when you do measure that on your computer you measure that volume calculation you are being much more precise because the information is much more visible in the pixel mm -hmm. am i explaining yeah. this yeah, I think you're I think you're on the money. So with this example, I use control points in the areas of sort of most extreme elevation change. So I did mm -hmm. control points on the roof and then control points at the base of the building. Had yeah. I done control points just on the roof, which would have would have been easy, I wouldn't have been able to verify the heights to be correct. So there may be yeah. maybe some compression or maybe some stretching out of the building in terms of elevation. So by doing them at top and bottom, that's a best practice. Same with bridges. We should probably always talk about control points and bridges being at the top of the bridge and something at the bottom if you're only bottom, doing them at the yeah. top you're kind of only getting half of the benefits of the control yeah 100 percent. right uh, and um another constraint that we can use these days with most uh, photographic software correct me here if i'm wrong ted you have more experience mm -hmm. than me is the scale constraint so if you do not have access to a uh, ground control point you can also scale your data set by having those scale constraints. So if uh, I know that this pillar is like 10 meter high, for example, mm -hmm. or I know, um, you know, like some distances within my uh, data, then you can input that into the software and then you can have that scale constraint in the, in the, um, in your data set. Yeah, exactly. So uh, scale constraints, a great way to do just the scale. If that's all you're worried about is measurements, yeah. just do a scale constraint. It's going gonna, it's gonna to effectively give you the same results. But if you also want to know where it is in the world, which way it's rotated, then you need to do controls. Control point. Uh, and so what we're zoomed in on here is uh, a representation of that error that we've calculated through these controls. So these little uh, pixels or these little squares, what those represent is we call those automatic tie points. So those are the locations mm -hmm. across images that the software automatically found uh, and then triangulated and put in this 3D space. The green cone represents my control point. So that's the coordinate that I told it, this is where it is. The blue cone represents the where it was calculated without my constraints. So, and then that green line that connects the two represents the error. So that error is yeah. in 3D. It can be up, down, in in all different directions. Uh, and sort of the length of that line is the magnitude of that error. So where the where my software or Pix4D in this case thought that point was going to be in relation to my marker is is actually shown right in these images, right? So what I did is I clicked on that automatic tie point. And I look now on my on the other hand uh, of my screen here, and you'll see these images appear. And then you also see this target. Um, so that is essentially where the software thought that point or that coordinate would be. Uh, and then that target is actually where it was. And if we click on the green pylon, you'll see that it's right on the target. So um, this is the difference between sort of the accuracy that you might be 
choosing to forego it you know sometimes it can be very small like this and i have to really zoom in to even see it sometimes it can be pretty sometimes large yeah, yeah so it, that also depends on the images themselves as well mm -hmm. and this process goes really quickly these days like as soon as you measure like a couple of pictures it automatically just um you know helps you to it's just like a refinement basically on that um uh, mm -hmm. on that position that you need to do so it's a very quick process yeah, absolutely. So when we're talking about precision versus accuracy, so, mm -hmm. so let's take this example of this 3D GCP. So we have the accuracy, which really just depends on how accurate my GPS observation was. Yeah. So there, there is a factor, a contributing factor to error. So that's a little bit of out, of out of our control sometimes, but generally we can affect it. And then there's the accuracy of our model. Uh, but then when we're talking about precision, we're talking about as we're zooming in, is How that good G you are. Yeah, like, it, you know, these are all pixels, right? So yeah. our, our GSD dictates how much how much space these pixels occupy in the world. Um, our accuracy is just a, a point where that point is in the world uh, with a GSD like you have here. We can put it anywhere on the screen. But is it here right in the middle of this pixel? Is it a little bit off to the side? That's our sort of smallest unit of measurement. So when you hear yeah. GSD, think precision. That's sort of the smallest unit of measurement. It's not your accuracy. It doesn't it, it, those two things are believe it or not, completely different in a lot of cases. They are. And, and so, and also like something that I want to emphasize is like, if you have a accuracy, geospatial accuracy of like three centimeters, for example, and your control points, your accuracy in the final 3D model or point cloud is never going to be better than that. Um, never ever, because that is dependent. You are actually pushing all your data to the absolute accuracy of your control points. Now, the resolution as you are showing here is like, it's going to help you to be more precise as you measure those points in your in your pixels mm -hmm. because if you have like a five millimeter ground sample distance would be much much more precise than a 15 millimeter ground sample distance mm -hmm. yeah and, and yeah. so and ground sampling distance we should also say is really dependent on the view right so in this example here we're looking at it top down so uh, everything in this every pixel should be about that ground sampling distance but yeah. when we're looking at a picture that's oblique right things start to change right this isn't as close as something that's over here. Sorry, this is much Available further points. away, right? Yeah. So your your ground sampling distance here isn't uniform across the image. Now, this isn't generally a, an issue when we're dealing with surveying and top-down imagery, but when we get into 3D scans like this one, it, 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 it's, it's one of those things that you need to understand. It's not one uniform number across your entire screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you also need to be picky when you, you know, choose the pictures where you are going to be measuring your tie points and your control points, because that might increase like the error that you will get in your measurements um, mm -hmm. because of what you're, you just explained. So um, you also need to be mindful of those um, errors that you are introducing by measuring um, your control points or your tie points in pictures where the the pixel is not as visible or the pixel is not as good or the precision might not be as good as uh, right. in other pictures. Yeah. Right, right. So so that's it, essentially. We've got our controls. We've got our alignments. We're looking pretty good. And then we go into the next step, which is to densify uh, and then to mesh and create that uh, mm -hmm. that sweet 3D model that we're used to seeing. Um, here's an example of what a dense cloud looks like, right? So this is that bridge example. I've done the alignment. I'm happy with it. I've done my controls. I'm happy with those. My accuracy is good. And then I go into the next step, the densification. And this is the result of that densification. So what you'll see is that it looks solid from afar. But as we zoom in, you'll see that it's point really cloud. just a fine, fine point cloud. And make these a little bit bigger. You can see them sort of starting to appear. Uh, and now this is what we're going to use to extract line work like this so you use uh, so so you are you actually just generated the densified point cloud you haven't even textured that point cloud uh, and it, it, yeah, you don't really need to. So the, yeah. the nice thing about photogrammetry is that when you do get a point cloud out of photo photogrammetry, unlike laser scanning, each point also has with it the color value of that point, mm -hmm. which can help you sort of 
look at what's going on. Yeah. yeah, but it's not enough for like inspection or for measuring cracks or for, for that mm -hmm. sort of thing. You really want to go to the textured mesh for that. Yeah. This is fantastic for extracting lines. So essentially what we're doing when we're extracting, we're looking at edges uh, and then we're, we're, we're clicking at specific locations on this point and drawing lines between those points. And so what you do is importing the point cloud, which format do you use? So there's a lot of formats for point clouds. There's the proprietary ones. There's also like just general ones. The one that's most common is LAS, stands for laser. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a pretty common one. Uh, generally, everything will will spit out an LAS if you ask it to or default to that. So that's what I chose to use here. But the one thing that I want to say is that generally from photogrammetry, the point cloud that you get is usually too dense. Like there's just too mm -hmm. many points. So my rule of thumb is I basically only need about 30% of the points that I got. 30%, wow. Mm. That's that's super interesting. So do you downsample that in Pix4D or any photogrammetry software? Or how do you? No, so I, I actually like to use Cloud Compare, which is what you're looking at yeah. here. It's a totally free software. I think it's made by like one person. It's absolutely amazing, but it has a lot of tools. They're a little bit, uh, the learning curve's a little steeper, but it's it's very easy to pick up once you get what you're doing. Uh, and I just subsample here. So right here, I just tell it 30% of what I input, give me that, and then I export that, and then I'm ready to start doing the line work, uh, which is, again, what you see here. So there's no need for 100% of them. There's just too many. And it can also bog down your system when you're doing this line work. So it's just unnecessary. You can shed some of that precision. You're not losing accuracy. You're just losing a little bit of precision when you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. So yeah, so Cloud Compare, uh, I really recommend everybody goes out and, and 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 picks it up and learns it. It's so powerful. You can do all kinds of different things on it. But ultimately, it's the images that matter, right? So if you have good images coming in, you're going to have good data like this going out. Uh, and then not all the software is, is the same. Some software will struggle with certain images. Some software may not. Um, and even how they pick the points can be different. Question now, for this specific work, did you need geospatial accuracy? Because if you're doing line work, I will expect that you're, you know, as, as long as you have good enough relative accuracy, that will be enough. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I did. Because we wanted to get accurate measurements out of this, uh, okay. I wanted to have both the geospatial accuracy in case of that I can come back and, com and, and compare it the next year. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure that scale is done. So by taking ground control points from the structure, I'm able to achieve both, right? So very easily, what I did in this example with controls, and you can kind of see them here, is that I'll make this full screen, is I, I, I flew uh, a pretty traditional 2D capture uh, type of map over, over the bridge. Uh, and I use the same methodology of painting those uh, little targets and and just hanging my rover over the uh, railing there and collecting it for a, for a minute or so. And I had those control points. And I also did it on the banks of the river. So I don't know if you can see them in, in this image specifically, but on the other side, I did them on the ground. So I did top and ground, and I did them at intervals that were pretty similar. So here's another one. And the mm -hmm. key here, especially for bridges, is that you're able to see this point. It's right at the corner, and you're able to see where that's marked from both the side and the top and then yep. that's how you're going to tie everything together because if you just if you put it in in words on the deck you might not see it from the edge when you're flying your 3d scan cool um and you're using revit for the line work sorry i'm just seeing a comment here yeah, Revit is the big one. There's all kinds of different tools to use for line work. I'm not the line work expert. I always subcontract that, right? So that's like that's like a lot of clicking in front of a computer screen, and it's, it takes like a ton of practice to get really, really good at it. So I, I don't have the time to pick that up as well on top of everything else. So I, I, I send it to really good people that I've, I've found on my network and give some suggestions. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they use they seem to use Revit quite a lot. So that's yeah. that's what I've seen. But ultimately, all I'm giving them is that point cloud that was exported in that step that was then subsampled in uh, in Cloud Compare, and, and everything from then on is up to uh, what you do on Revit to, to extract these uh, these lines and, and profiles. Amazing! Um, thank you for that. We are 48 minutes in, uh, Ted. If you wanna, there's anything any 
point that we forgot to before yeah. we start wrapping up? Well, so if there's anybody in here that is is generally new to photogrammetry and um, and, and you're looking at sort of how to get started, what I would recommend is is go and download Reality Capture. It's a, it's a fantastic app. It's got uh, it's got a little bit of a learning curve, but there's a lot of documentation out there on how to get started. The thing about Reality Capture is, is it's very it's very affordable, so you don't actually have to pay anything unless you're exporting the data out. And mm -hmm. learning photogrammetry is a lot of trial and error. So Reality Capture gives you that benefit of being able to try different projects, try different scenes, put it into Reality Capture for free, do it on your own machine, and just keep doing that until you sort of learn what works and what doesn't. That's how I learned. Um, and I, I really, really love Reality Capture. And beyond that, once you get a little bit more advanced, Reality Capture is really, really deep. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Mm -hmm. um, definitely all the stuff we talked about today, control, scale constraints, ortho mosaics, and even mosaics off the side. You can do meshes. You can even combine laser scan data uh, and photogrammetry together, which sort of gives you the ultimate deliverable. Um, yeah. uh, so you can do all of that once you get more comfortable with it. And you really only have to pay if you want to export it out and, and send it to somebody else or do something else with it. So. I must admit the, uh, the the user interface is a bit overwhelming. Like even even for myself, it's like whoa, there's a lot going on here. But it's a very good point that it's a it's a free software as long as you know you are testing in the in and you don't export any data. So it's it's actually a very good tip. Uh, I like this. I might I might do that too. <laughs> I might get a familiar with reality capture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I I always urge everybody to just try the same thing in different softwares and see how yeah. the, how they change and sort of what they excel at, and then find the one you like the most, and then maybe commit to that one for commercial use. Yeah, but um, when you so, don't have the luxury like you and 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 me of having like multiple licenses, it's a very good way to get familiar with the with the workflow and with the best practices without having to pay a massive amount of money. Yeah, ab absolutely. And mm -hmm. I agree with you. Like the, the UI in reality capture is kind of complex, but it's when you start to figure it out, it's yeah. really not that bad. And it has a lot of sort of flexibility. So here I'm able to show four different things, but they all relate to the same uh, area. Um, mm -hmm. And sort of what you're seeing here as well, which I think is really cool, is the matches. So these green dots mm -hmm. are where the software found similar features across all of these images. So if you'd like to see even more detail about that you can do this show matches and it'll start drawing these lines between them and it really helps you understand like what's going on if an area isn't working well is it because i don't have matches is it because the the image needs some retouching do i need control points to sort of help it align those things um it's it's really really valuable to see it from this perspective i think mm -hmm. cool yeah um what else do we have in there before we wrap up and uh, we've missed something feel free to drop a comment with uh, any requests for uh, you know topics that we've um, we haven't addressed in the in the webinar today is there anything else Ted, that we will uh, I'm just looking through some of these uh, some of these uh, comments. comments. I see one that says, "What about all of the other exif, EXIF data pan tilt roll of drone and gimbal? When will it be used uh, in drone deploy?" I think you mean just in photogrammetry. Um, so that's that's I think that's a good question. So um, what we get in that metadata from the drone is the position. Uh, of the drone when the the, the picture was taken. Um, we also get some information about the angle of the gimbal and which direction the drone was facing. But just from the limitations of the sensors and the sort of the accuracy of, of what we get from that, we, we can't really trust those. So they give us, they give us uh, an estimate, but really the photogrammetry software, what it's doing is it's figuring all of that stuff out with some high certainty. Uh, and it's using the overlap to most do that. So uh, that's not something that we can just rely on right off of the drone. With LiDAR, we use much more complicated, much more accurate sensors because we're doing direct georeferencing, and that will be there. Uh, but with photogrammetry, it's very different. Um, and we, we essentially can now use any camera, even if we don't have that information to align. Hmm, cool. And there's another comment here. Can the photogrammetry engine handle multiple exposures of the same image? Uh, 
so I, I think so multiple exposures so like bracketing I think maybe what they're referring to so sort of the same position but multiple exposures so mm -hmm. general so the answer is yes it probably can but generally you do not want to incorporate images that are from the same position and have different uh, angles of view or orientation uh, that can trick things and make it a little bit more complicated for the software to handle so as long as you're moving between exposures then you should be fine uh, photogrammetry kind of depends on that parallax effect when you're moving through a scene so um, if you don't have that parallax effect you can cre actually be creating more problems for yourself by bringing <laughs> multiple images with different exposures from the same view so yeah. answer is yes but be careful yeah is there a way to incorporate ppk data with a skydio level gps so PPK is kind of a, another sort of more complex topic. So what it, what it would mm -hmm. say is PPK relies on very specific uh, GP, GPS receivers to be able to do that. So uh, unless you're equipped with that, you're you're not going to be able to uh, get the files and run post processing uh, on those uh, on those on those tags. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that is it kind of depends on what you're doing and what you're using. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, what are the best mesh formats that Reality Capture produces for use in visualization production? That's yeah, so one. Reality Capture is like really, it, it's used by a lot of people in the production industry and in the VFX mm -hmm. industry. So I, I guarantee you it supports almost everything you're going to want. The one that I use the most is actually what's called an OBJ. Uh, so for, for meshes, um, like I mentioned, there is the actual structure, the triangulated mesh, and then there's the texture as well that's wrapped around it. So those two things are generally stored uh, separately. Uh, and uh, I like OBJs because they're, they're, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, and they're very flexible around where you can import them. But if you have something more specific that you need, Reality Capture is probably going to be the one that's going to support it because they have so much, so many users that are in that industry. Um, I yes. have to say though that Context Capture also has a ton of of uh, exportable formats for the mesh. Uh, and uh, again, I usually stick to OBJs, but there's a lot of options there. Yeah. Cool. Um, will we wrap up, um, or is there anything else, Ted? That you want to tackle? Uh, well, there's again, as always, there's a lot that I want to tackle, but no, <laughs> not every time you <laughs> ask me that, that question, a, that was a bad way to put it. Let's wrap up for today. Um, we will be following up on all the comments we haven't addressed during the uh, doing the event. Ted and I will will do that with the. Um, yeah, we we'll, we we'll love doing that after after the webinar. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any further questions. Um, the webinar will be available in our YouTube channel, um, so I'll share that with everyone afterwards. And stay tuned for the next one. Um, who knows what will be? Uh, but I would love to do actually a live one from from the field uh, with you, Ted. So let's see if we can set that up. That might be a bit challenging, but um, I'm 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 up for that challenge. Are you? Yeah, that's yeah. It's going to be interesting. We'll do our best. I can't. <laughs> we'll that. do our best. <laughs> Cool. Well, as always, Ted, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. And I'll see you very soon. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.